Welcome to CFTC Talks. I'm your host, Andy Bush. Just a quick reminder, there's a disclaimer at the end of the show that's important for you to hear. Hey, before we get started, I just wanted to let you know we have a simple way for you to communicate with us. Spoiler alert, it's called email. That's right. You can send your ideas for future shows and feedback, criticisms, and suggestions to podcasts at cftc.gov. That's P-O-D-C-A-S-T-S at cftc.gov. Now, you can already leave comments on many of the outlets that the show appears on, but we thought we'd make it, you know, just a lot easier for you, the listener, to connect to the show. Uh, By the way, if we take your suggestions, we may give you a shout out on the show and let you know that we did. All right, enough about that. Let's get to the show. Over the last few months, I have been learning a lot as the show has been covering technology, fintech, virtual currencies, and blockchain. And and I hope you've been enjoying it as much as I have. Because uh, we've heard from some amazing guests like Alex Rampell from Andreessen Horowitz or Coinsetter's Peter Van Valkenburg and Chamber of Commerce's um, Perry Ann Boring. I mean, great guests. And I would actually, I would also do a little shout out here to the CFTC's Dan Gorfine as well, because he's great. Now, each has had an interesting and unique perspective on how fintech, broadly speaking, has been changing and impacting our markets and world. I don't know about you out there, but this stuff is moving so fast that I feel like I'm consuming and reading as much as I can every day just to stay in place. So that's why it's so great to have on these guests to tell us not only what's going on now, but what might happen in the future. But I have to say, I felt like we were missing a piece of the puzzle. And that piece is this. How do these companies in financial services view these changes and new technologies? You know, the, the, the people that are actually deploying the new technologies and trying to create jobs and growth. Where do they see things headed? Today, we're bringing on someone who gets into the guts of how these financial services firms work and what they're doing in this space. Julian Korb leads PwC U.S. Financial Services Advisory. They're covering banking, capital markets, insurance, asset wealth management companies. He advises C-suite executives at major financial services institutions on how to address issues related to growth and performance improvement, really growth and performance improvement, digital transformation, financial crime and regulatory compliance, as well as technology and operation effectiveness. Julian, welcome to CFTC Talk. Well, thank you, Andy, for having me. Well, let's start off with providing our listeners some context of this intersection between finance and technology, because over the last five years, we've seen a rapid growth of startups and small tech firms entering into the financial services space and creating disruptions for existing firms. What were the top three drivers for, for why this began happening? Well, thank you, Andy, for for, for the question. It has been a very exciting um, five years. And and I have to say, it's not only startups and small tech firms, but also actually a lot of big tech companies have decided to um, to really enter into the financial services space. Uh, I think they they were seeing the um, the opportunity to to uh, get into a space where. Pretty large financial services companies didn't necessarily have the ability to, to, to jump in. And, and if we think about the top three areas, I would say number one, the, the rapid pace at which customer expectations were changing. I think they felt that there was an opportunity to, to bring some nimbleness in, in answering these expectations and providing a very different experience. Mm-hmm. Number two, the advancement in technology specifically around mobile um, to provide access and distribution and how mobile capabilities could actually deliver some of these financial services um, products or services or, or, or what have you. And then number three, uh, a very extremely, extremely large and even larger, larger amount of data that right. um, was um, becoming available for for um, uh, mining and uh, doing some analytics and providing some different types of answers or services to customers. And again, I think a lot of companies saw uh, the data analysis capability that they had for uh, or they wanted to build as a very interesting and important tool to address this large amount of data that uh, that were available to them. 
Yeah, it's fascinating, the, the advent of the use of data science, looking at these huge amounts of data on their clients and their behaviors and, and how to deliver better services, I think is really fascinating. So that's a great point. But well, let me bring this forward to today. Large financial services firms, from insurance companies to banks, are, are attempting to recenter their efforts towards embracing these new technologies that you, you discussed a little bit. And, and really, from their customer standpoint, what are the customers looking for? What do they want from a digital, online, mobile standpoint? Because clearly, they're driving the bus, right? No, absolutely. And, and I think customers want and, and expect easy to find, personalized, and, uh, and frictionless services. They don't want to have to deal with paperwork or forms of multi-part steps to complete a, a relatively simple service. And, and I think a lot of FS firms are being challenged to deliver that almost real-time end-to-end service. When we're talking about uh, a loan, we're talking about uh, opening a new account, um, and, and I think customers are, are expecting this. And in the digital world, the, the cus- consumer-centric experience are highly intuitive and that are, that are actually being defined by technology companies, the very big technology companies that consumers interact with, with on a daily basis. And this is the bar that, uh, that FS firms are being measured against. Yeah, you know, it's interesting that you say that because we had uh, Alex Rempel from uh, Andreessen Horowitz on and he made the observation, it's kind of funny, that millennials uh, view that having to actually talk to someone on the phone was a bug in their in their digital banking ex- experience. So, in other words, they, they want real-time answers or outcomes for the service they want online. So, so how can financial services rebrand themselves to address this? So it's a really interesting question, right? Because actually some banks are already starting to rebrand themselves and they're building uh, brands for exactly that, that purpose, right? They're mm. building uh, what I would say mobile only um, banking capabilities to actually address that, uh, that pure uh, native, if you will, digital experience to, uh, f- for the customers. A, a big issue that banks have been dealing with have been dealing with their legacy um, IT infrastructure, which has right. been a limiting factor for agility and innovation. And I think b- banks are starting to build what we call the, these APIs with, around their um, uh, legacy IT infrastructure to actually mitigate that, fac- that, that factor and, and migrate some of their services to, to a cloud environment to, to enable some higher level of agility and so on. And maybe the, the, the third point on this is um, banks are also really looking at partnership models mm-hmm. where they see that incumbent banks and tech companies can actually come together and bring a very unique uh, solution to, 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 the, to the market. And then it seemed that the past couple of weeks we've seen announcements like almost every other day on some large partnership between a bank and a big tech company providing a new type of, um, of financial service. Yeah, it's fascinating to me because I I look at this from the standpoint of I I worked in financial services for a long time and for a bank for a long time. But the the component of that that really, I think, resonates with um, clients and millennials is is the payment component. Right. I mean, that's the first kind of interface. You you earn money and you want to spend it, but you want to do it in a way that's really easy. and, And that remains a critical component of financial services. But but companies like Venmo and Square have really changed somewhat of the nature of the infrastructure of how this has been previously working. And I thought it was fascinating what you just said about the APIs that they're, that banks are, are, are trying to find a way to um, maybe bootstrap their uh, financial payments or payment component of what they're doing so that, you know, uh, a, a consumer can make a payment to, you know, pick up a pizza without having to sign anything or just show up and, and click on something. So they have all these really fun names for the new kind Kind of branding that they're doing, but I guess you know. My guess, my question is to you, um, Juliet, is how, how do you see what's happening here, and, and how are the existing financial services companies adapting? You mentioned the the APIs, but it, it seems like they're they're trying to create um, things that are very similar to Venmo and Square. No, absolutely. I mean, the reality is that transformation inside financial services firms tend to be slow. 
So um, at the same time, there's a lot of innovation occurring at, at these uh, these large financial services firms, and and some of this is just happening behind the scene and starting to to create now some momentum um, in more kind of uh, in the in, in the market itself. I would say if you think about what they're trying to do, and, and there's probably a couple of areas that that I could mention. One that um, that when they look at the payment infrastructure that they have, right, um, they really want to expand to a B2B payment environment that based on underlying infrastructure built on blockchain. Mm. Right. And I'm sure we're going to talk a little more about blockchain. <laughs> That's my next question. <laughs> but go ahead. But, go ahead. Uh, but frankly, this is like something that people are trying to do to kind of um, leverage a new technology that enables them to kind of have this um, this kind of um, payment infrastructure that's going to change change the game. The other point, which is a bit what I think you were referring to, is many major banks are now enabling real-time peer-to-peer payments. We've seen a number of banks coming together to build these real-time peer-to-peer um, uh, payment companies or payment brands that uh, that are, are trying to change um, change the their market presence and and how. Payment infrastructure is evolving is evolving as well, and and maybe la- one last area is the uh, another area is the tokenization mm-hmm. uh, that uh, a lot of banks are investigating. I don't think it's necessarily um, uh, in large scale production environment now, but it's definitely something that people are looking at, and and it's it's essentially um, the the ability to provide a digital token to um, to consumers. You know, to push this token to the commerce ecosystem for for seamless payment, and um, and so it's really removing the notion of providing payment information and, and changing the nature of payments. Hey, just wanted to take a quick break from the show to let you know about an event we're co-hosting with Kansas State University that I'll be emceeing and speaking at. It's on April 5th and 6th in Overland Park, Kansas, and and that's right in the Kansas City metropolitan area. We're doing an Agricultural Futures Conference with KSU's Center for Risk Management, Education and Research. Protecting America's Agricultural Markets and Agricultural Commodity Futures Conference will be the first of its kind conference and include robust presentations and discussions on current macroeconomic trends and issues affecting American agricultural futures markets and the importance of those markets for managing risk and protecting participants from manipulation, fraud and other unlawful activities. The conference will have special guest speakers and panels discussing key topics and papers. Some of the invited speakers are CFTC Chairman Chris Giancarlo and KSU's John Flores. You can find information on the conference on our cftc.gov website, or you can go to KSU's website and search for 2018 Agricultural Commodity Futures Conference. Now, the conference is less than a month away and is filling up fast, and I hope you can come to it. And if you do, please come up and say hello. I'd love to chat. Back to the show. You know, it's really interesting that you bring up tokens because um, I've, I've seen, to me, it tokens, the use of tokens is really uh, so much about the bootstrapping um, for a company to get people onto their platform. Um, and so if they have a valuable uh, virtual currency uh, and a to- or a token, then it, 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 that, that creates the belief that um, it would be a good thing to mine. And then it also encourages people to uh, join the platform. I'm, I'm thinking of, uh, I keep using uh, Filecoin, but I think that's probably one of the best examples that's out there uh, in that space. So it's interesting that payment companies and banks are looking at something similar um, in, in the sense of trying to get people onto their platform. So that's really interesting. I hadn't heard that before. So thank you for mentioning that. But and, and, and getting back to the, the payment component, because I, I wanted to ask you about this. We, we mentioned blockchain, but you know the peer-to-peer computing and, and blockchain technology, that those are not new. But the development of the consensus mechanism, obviously, leading to venture 
cap or leading to uh, virtual currencies and tokens. I, obviously, that's the new kind of component. And there's open and closed consensus architecture. We've seen companies recently in the news begin to utilize this technology for things like um, trade and agriculture and, and other services. So from where you sit at PwC, how are your clients engaging really in, in that use, maybe more a little bit more specifically? You mentioned the payment component, but it seems like banks are driving this um, uh, usage of of the blockchain for specifically like trade. Like I'm thinking of like you know selling thirty million dollars worth of corn um, because the, the DLT of distributed ledger technology in a closed architecture system um, would eliminate a lot of the paperwork. And I think that's where people get excited about it. No, I, I agree, and, and I think you 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 made a very interesting uh, differentiation between the open um, consensus architecture and the closed consensus architecture, and 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 many companies today are working on this private blockchain, right? right? Which is really the concept of smart contracts, where different parties on the network are known, the governance model has been established and has been agreed to, and companies are kind of contracting with each other on that blockchain. And it's much simpler than what we could call the public blockchain, where Bitcoin and other large digital currencies run on, um, since you need to kind of establish consensus with unknown parties. Mm -hmm. So so I think we, we, we've seen a lot of this development. At the same time, I have to say it's still at the experimentation level in financial services. The the technology is still early and, and many what I would call bank grade requirements such as security and transaction throughput and scalability are still being developed and, and, and have yet to be tested in in full uh, production environment. Yeah, it's a nascent technology, right? I mean, this is <laughs> something that's everyone's pouring everyone. I shouldn't say that. Many people are pouring billions of dollars into it, right? Um, because of of the um, potential for this to reduce um, paperwork and to be much more efficient. Yep. And, and I think that's where things get exciting. Of course, there's there's all sorts of AML issues and KYC issues uh, anytime you get involved with banks. So that's the challenging component of it. All right. Let me, in the little bit of time that we have left, let me switch gears a little bit because PwC, which puts out a ton of great research that's available on your website and for free. So I, I you know, I think it's great. People should go there and take a look at it. Um, I'm not recommending it. I'm just saying this is a great thing that that more companies I would like to see do, which is put out a lot of research because uh, it helps people understand the environment that they're in. But recently, PwC put out eight digital predictions for 2018, and they cover a wide range of things like facial recognition, cryptocurrencies. But on that list, and there's there's a lot of really uh, interesting things that are on that list, but number three kind of stood out to me on the list. And it was interesting because it states that the industry, financial services industry, not regulators, will take the lead on data sharing standards in the United States. And I guess my question to you, uh, Julian, is why do you think that will happen? Well, I think for starters, it has already starting to happen, right? Agencies such as the CFPB have been working with financial services firms on just this topic mm -hmm. of consumer authorized data sharing. And they've actually published uh, some guidance in, in uh, October of last year um, um, non-binding guidance to essentially challenge the industry to take the lead. And I think a lot of banks and fintech companies want to move very aggressively in this data sharing um, world where, uh, where they really uh, feel they're going to have the opportunity to, to monetize the data and be able to share information uh, or data be between themselves much more effectively. At the same time, security and the development of standards are probably two of the bigger challenges that uh, that bank uh, are facing in that space. And, and we think that broader industry cooperation will uh, will accelerate the development of security standards and and of standards for um, data sharing as well as security solutions. Uh, and that will unfold um, this year to bring to bring progress on on both these fronts. Um, and so I think that's really what's what's driving the need and and why we think the industry is going to take the lead. 
Yeah, and I can't emphasize that enough. It's so important to have those because otherwise you have all the disparate um, structures that are out there and they don't necessarily lend themselves to talking to each other or, or easily interfacing with each other. You, you talked about the APIs just with banks to their more mobile things, but then if you're looking out from bank to bank or B2B, then if you don't have standards, it's really a problem. Um, so that's a great point. All right, let me get to number four on the list, which is that financial services firms will more broadly embrace open soft software uh, and as contributors. And, and to that end, I wonder, Julian, taking it kind of a step further, how, how is that going to impact cyber? I mean, clearly, when you're talking about open source software and, um, and different um, data sharing kind of opportunities, uh, there's a lot of scrutiny on cyber and say, security yeah. overall. Mm -hmm. um, and um, at the same time, it's not necessarily a new area and, and the industry continues to, to work on very aggressively on, on providing the right security solution, uh, cyber security solutions. Um, I, I do believe to some extent um, open source is not necessarily going to increase the level of, uh, of, of risk, but uh, we see a lot of risk in many proprietary solutions mm -hmm. and 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 I think uh, it's uh, it's very comparable the the cyber risk that exists between the proprietary solution and open source standard dollar raising but every every I mean every day every week there's more learning around it on how to actually better protect it how to actually create scalability for their services and so on so so I think it's uh, it's definitely consumer um, or demand driven but but people are learning about it very quickly and and making progress in um, in uh, integrating it within their their services, which is why we, we're making that prediction. Yeah, we had uh, Perry Ann Boring from the uh, uh, Chamber of Digital Commerce on last week, and one of the things that she was wishing for would be to have coordinated regulation. So it's <laughs> you know I guess it's the same kind of component of the coordinated or or data sharing standards uh, that we mentioned earlier. Just how okay. important that is, right? So, okay, before I let you go, <laughs> I have to ask you, because we're at the end here, but what do you see are the top three challenges for companies you cover in 2018? Well, so I'll, 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 uh, I'll um, just, just to focus on the, what we've discussed today and to, uh, to come back to some of, some of the key points we mentioned, I would say number one is the um, establishment of the right governance models, specifically when it comes to blockchain, data sharing and others, how to find the right balance between an open decentralized network and the need to actually connect with um, and sharing information with each other. So number one, setting up the right governance models between uh, between the different companies. Mm -hmm. Number two, what we call the explainable AI, right? A lot of companies are investing a lot in artificial intelligence, but one of the issues that they're facing is, which is very regulatory driven as well, is, uh, is to explain the reason for why a decision was made. Um, and in some cases, they have also to point specifically the data that that decision was based on. Mm -hmm. And so when you can imagine, right, when you, you have, you have, for example, in a credit, um, credit situation where decision is made to not ac take a, accept a loan or accept right. customers and what right. have you, there's a lot of explanation you, from a regulatory standpoint you need to be able to provide so that, um, um, uh, that explainable AI is, is, I think, a key challenge for, for, for many financial services firms today. And then, uh, we, listen, we just mentioned it, right? But I think it's a significant force we, we cannot ignore. But the, what are the next steps for Bitcoin? And specifically, as much as companies are, are really investing in it and starting to develop their own solutions, um, as you said a bit earlier, the proper risk management framework, the uh, liquidity uh, risk, the reputational risk um, considerations, the security and what have you are all elements that um, financial services firms need to get more comfortable with. It's a big challenge, um, especially given all the unknowns in that space. Julian Korb from PwC, thanks for coming on the show today. That's a wrap for CFTC Talks this week. Remember, if you want to hear more podcasts, you can go to our website, cftc.gov, and click on the podcast button. Or you can find us on iTunes by searching for CFTC Talks on your podcast app. We're on iTunes, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, Spotify, Google Play, and Libsyn, so you don't have to just go to iTunes, obviously. Um, and also, you know, hit subscribe if you want to get it every week. 
We'll be back next week with another guest on our quest to learn about the markets we watch. I'm Andy Bush. Thanks for listening. This has been CFTC Talks. But wait, we're not done yet. It's time for a disclaimer. The CFTC is providing this information as a public service, and it is neither a legal interpretation nor a statement of CFTC policy. Reference to any specific product, service, trademark, manufacturer, or service provider does not constitute an endorsement or recommendation by the CFTC. The CFTC is not liable to any consumer or any third party for any direct, indirect, incidental, consequential, special, or exemplary damages or lost profit related to the use of the information provided or referenced in this podcast. Selection of guests on the podcast does not imply an endorsement of any particular individual or entity. Many individuals and entities provide similar services to those of the guests. The views and opinions expressed by the guests in the podcast are their own and not specifically endorsed by the CFTC. Moreover, the information provided in this podcast should not be construed as investment advice. Consumers should rely on their own inquiries as to accuracy and relevance of the information incorporated or referenced in this podcast and assume the entire risk related to its use. The CFTC is providing its interpretation of market trends solely to inform the public of a framework for projecting possible outcomes under different scenarios. If you have any questions concerning the meaning or application of a particular law or rule administered by the CFTC, please consult an attorney.